I want to welcome you to this Bible lesson brought to you by your friends at the Caledonia Church of Christ located at 846 Main Street in Caledonia, Mississippi. If you should have a question about this presentation, if you'd like to make a comment, or if you're seeking spiritual guidance with a desire to serve the Lord and go to heaven, please reach out to us using the contact information provided at the end. Your speaker for this lesson is Tim Childs, the evangelist for the Caledonia Church of Christ. And as always, we hope you'll be blessed in the hearing of God's Word. I'd like to join with Brother Danny in welcoming each of you for this period of our worship together. We're so thankful that um, you're able to be in the assembly. I look around and I see we have a number of visitors with us again today in addition to our home folks. <clears throat> and we're thankful that you've come. We want you to feel welcome and blessed by our assembly. And uh, if you have any questions about anything that we do in our worship, uh, feel free to, to come to us and ask. And we'd love to have the opportunity to sit down with you and discuss those matters and maybe even have a Bible study together if you'd be interested. We're blessed that today is the Lord's Day. And there's nothing better that you and I could be doing than being together as God's family, neighbors, and friends on this day to worship Him. <clears throat> Today I want us to think about a topic entitled, Heaven Will Surely Be Worth It All. Heaven Will Surely Be Worth It All. I think about the, the recipients of the Hebrew epistle. The Hebrew writer was addressing a group of individuals that were struggling with their faith. They were trying to decide whether they should press on, whether they should continue with this new religion called Christianity, or whether they should turn back to the religion of their fathers, Judaism. As it was in those days, so it is in our day. There are sometimes those people who, who lose heart. There are people that grow weary. There are people that sometimes become distracted in one way or another by the world. And there are those who are lured away from Jesus to go back into the way of the world. In the book of Galatians, the sixth chapter, verses eight and nine, the Bible says, he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. In our Bible class, we've been looking at the accuracy of the Bible. The Bible is reliable. You and I can place our trust in the writings of Scripture because they are inspired of God. And when God's Word talks about heaven, when God's Word encourages us about the future time that we will reap the gift of life everlasting, we can rest assured that that is what is reserved for those who are God's people, for those who enter into that covenant relationship with Him, who wear Christ and who are uh, in the body of of God, the family of Christ, the family of God. Heaven will be worth it all. Cole read in our hearing just a moment ago from Matthew chapter 5, a portion of that reading, verses 10 through 12. And there is a phrase that I want to impress upon your mind at this time. Jesus said, great is your reward in heaven. In your mind, recite that. Great is your reward in heaven. The Bible says, <clears throat> Jesus here in the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely, for my sake. Here it is in verse 12. Jesus says to his disciples, and this message rings true equally for you and me, to rejoice and be exceeding glad. Why? 
For great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Jesus wants his audience to understand that they are not or will not be the first to experience persecution and hardship for following Jesus. The prophets of old who called God's people back to God, who told them about the coming Messiah, they were individuals that were persecuted. Sometimes they were imprisoned and sometimes they were put to death. Heaven will surely be worth all the shame that you and I may be called upon to experience in this world. In, Matt, in Acts chapter 5 and verse 41, the apostles had been imprisoned. They had been commanded by the high priest and the, the, set, the uh, Sanhedrin that they were not to teach or to preach in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. But they were devout. They were interested in doing the will of heaven and they understood that it was important to obey God rather than men. These men were beaten and released. And the Bible says, Luke records in verse 41, how that they were glad and rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for His name. In 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 17, the Bible says, for our light affliction. Now, let's think for just a moment about Paul as he is trying to persuade and encourage the Corinthians. Paul is an individual who personally has suffered enormously for Jesus. He's been shipwrecked. He has been beaten and, and he's been stoned actually and left for dead. He has been beaten. He has suffered enormously for Christianity. And even yet, even in all, in spite of everything he has suffered, he is able to express the type of affliction that he and the Corinthians either have experienced or are experiencing or will experience. He calls it light affliction. It is light in comparison to the affliction that Jesus experienced for us. And it is light in comparison with the eternal weight of glory that you and I will experience on the other side. He says our light affliction, which is it's but for a moment, Remember, this, anything that you're experiencing here and now is temporary. It's not permanent. It is but for a moment. And this light affliction that you and I are enduring worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Heaven will be worth all the sacrifice that you and I are called upon to make. And as Christians, we're called upon to make sacrifice for Jesus. The Apostle Paul personally sacrificed to be a Christian, to be faithful and loyal to his God and King. In this reading of Philippians chapter 3, Paul talks about himself. He's addressing those who place their confidence in the flesh, that is, in their ability to keep the law, Verses seeking to be justified by the faith of Jesus Christ. Paul says that who among you is able to put trust in the flesh more than I myself? I mean, I was circumcised the eighth day according to the law. I am an Israelite. I am a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I am a Pharisee. If there is anybody of his contemporary that could place their trust in the flesh, that is, in their ability to keep the law, more than himself, raise your hand. There was no one. And yet Paul was willing to sacrifice his standing among the Jews, possibly being among the Sanhedrin. He had been brought up at the feet of Gamaliel. He was taught in the customs of the law. He was a man that was devout. He had great, enormous standing among the Jewish leaders. And yet he was willing to give it all up, to sacrifice it all in order that he might 
have a relationship with his Savior, the Messiah, that had been predicted hundreds of years before. He says, how be it what things were gained to me, that is his standing in the, in the Jewish religion, these have I counted loss for Christ. Yea, verily, I count all things to be for the excellency, all things to be lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and to count them but refuse, that I may gain Christ. That is, all of these things we saw earlier concerning the, the stamp of King Hezekiah. I was talking to Brother Jay right before our, our service this morning, and he was talking about how that, that that was something that was important, but yet it was found in the trash heap. It was cast in the garbage. That's where it was found. And that is what Paul is saying here. The things of my standing in the Jewish religion, I count it as rubbish. I count it as trash. It is garbage in comparison to the relationship that I have with Jesus, that I might have this relationship, that I might have knowledge of Him, and that I might gain Him and eternal reward. Heaven will surely be worth all the service that you and I are called upon to render. Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2. You and I are taught to be a living sacrifice. Our physical body is to be a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is our reasonable service. Now bear in mind that heaven will surely be worth all of our service because God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed toward his name, in that you minister to the saints and do minister. What if God was like you and me? Now, you and I, we have a tendency to forget some things. Sometimes we forget people's names. Sometimes we forget individuals. It's been a few years. And we forget maybe the impact that they had on our lives at one point. But God is not a man. And God is not forgetful. And what the Hebrew writer is impressing upon his reader's mind is this that you don't have to worry about God forgetting. God is going to remember. Come judgment day, when you stand before the judgment bar of Christ, God will remember the service that you've rendered in His name. Heaven will surely be worth a lifetime of commitment to Christ. In Matthew 20, 1 through 6, Jesus gives a parable about a householder, a man who's going out and he's hiring laborers to come and to work in his vineyard. He goes out very early in the morning and he says, I will give you such and such amount at the end of the day. And so they go into the vineyard and they begin to work. The same man, he goes out the, the ninth hour or the, the, the third hour of the day at 9 a.m. He goes out at the sixth hour at 12. He goes out at the ninth hour at 3 p.m. He goes out at the eleventh hour of the day and he hires people to come and to work in this vineyard and he says at the end of the day, in, in an hour or two, when the work day is complete, I will pay you what is right. Now, the point here that I want to make is that, that, that certain people enter, we, we enter into the kingdom into the vineyard at, at various points in our lifetime. Some enter into the kingdom very early in the morning, very early in life's day. Some become a Christian in their early teenage years. Some become a Christian in their 20s or their 30s. Some become a Christian in their 50s. Some become a Christian in their 70s, 80s, or even in their 90s. But what we're pointing and pressing upon our minds today is, is that heaven will surely be worth it all. The service, the lifetime of commitment that you made when you became a Christian in your early youth. You see, you don't need to delay until you're 50 or 80 or 90. It's not like I need to wait. I need to give myself to the world and, and wait until some convenient season or wait until my into my well adult years or into my sunset years that then it will be worth it it is worth what the lord will endow us with a lifetime of, of commitment to christ heaven will be worth it a life of living outside my comfort zone someone has said that jesus came to 
comfort the afflicted, and he came to afflict the comfortable. And I say that there's a lot of truth to that. Jesus came in his heart of compassion to comfort those who were in distress, those who were hurting, those who were afflicted. And then there were those who were comfortable where they were. Are you and I comfortable? Is that what it is all about being a Christian? Is, is staying in our comfort zone? You see, it, it's not always comfortable to come before the assembly, for instance, and lead a prayer. It, it's not always comfortable and easy to come before the assembly and, and read a scripture or to wait at the Lord's table. But, but these are just two or three examples of what I'm talking about. What about sitting down with someone and, and opening up the Bible and sharing with them what they need to do to become a Christian? For some of us, that's not easy. For some of us, that's not comfortable. And yet, Christ would have us as his people to open our mouths and speak on his behalf. You see, you and I need to remember that Christianity is not about being comfortable. The people of old Israel, they wanted a message of peace. And sometimes they abused the prophets because they didn't tell them what they wanted to hear. You and I need to hear the Word of God. We need to receive it into our lives and we need to allow the Word to change our way of thinking, our habits, our way of life. Heaven will surely be worth a life outside my comfort zone. I remember back when I was a young boy in school and I had my peers. And sometimes I didn't feel like I fit in. I felt like I was over here on the side. I didn't participate in some of the things that the young people did. Sometimes I felt isolated. Sometimes I felt alone. Heaven will surely be worth a life outside one's comfort zone. It will be worth a life of conflict with the world. In Matthew 10, 16 through 25, Jesus taught his disciples that it's not always going to be easy. You're going to have conflict. And in the world, there are those that, that there is conflict. There are different people in the world. There are people that are in the world because they are victims of circumstances. They're, they're, they're in the world not because so much that they hate God. No. They're lost and in the world because they've been deceived. They've been led astray by the evil one. And so they find themselves in the world. We don't have conflict with those people. But, but there are people, as we think about our society, our culture today, there, there are those who hate God. There, there are those who are vicious, who r rage against the Bible, God, Jesus. And there's going to be conflict with those people. If you and I are willing to stand with the Lord, the Bible says all those that live godly in Christ Jesus may suffer persecution. No. It says they shall. Do you and I compromise with the world to avoid conflict? I don't like conflict. But Jesus told his disciples, you're going to experience it. And he says, you're going to be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. In Philippians 1, 28 and 30, the Bible says, Paul writing, And nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them, an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him. See, that's where, that's where so many religious people are. But maybe where some of us are. We're satisfied, we're content merely to believe on Christ. But here he says, it is given in the behalf of Christ also to suffer for his sake. 
having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. There is more to Christianity than simply believing on Jesus. You and I have got to follow him. You and I have got to take up our cross daily and die to self. Heaven will surely be worth it all because of the kind of place heaven is. Do you spend time in the scriptures thinking about how beautiful heaven must be? Heaven is a place of the greatest assembly. The greatest assembly. In Matthew 8, verse 11, Jesus talks about how that people will come from the east and the west, and they will come and they will sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Who's going to be in heaven? God will be there. His son Jesus, who died for you and me, will be there. The Holy Spirit will be there. The angels, the holy angels will be there. Those who have been redeemed of God will be there. It will be the greatest assembly ever known to man. And I want to be there. And I want you to be there. Heaven will be worth it all because it is a place of the greatest assembly. It is a place of the sweetest rest. Hebrews 4, 1 through 11. The Hebrew writer in this passage emphasizes how that during the days of Joshua, that was not the, the full and final rest that God had in mind for His people. There we read, There remaineth a rest to the people of God. And he says, he encourages the Hebrew Christians to be diligent that they might enter into that rest rather than fall aside by the same example of the unbelief of some. Heaven is a place of the highest joy, happiness, and pleasure. Psalm 16, 8 through 11. A prophecy that has its application with Jesus as he was anticipating the glory of being with his Father in heaven after his death. Thou would not leave my soul in Hades, neither shalt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. In thy presence is joy forevermore. Some of those things, maybe not all of them, but some of those things are equally applicable to you and me. In the presence of God, there is joy. In the presence of God in heaven, there is peace. And there is pleasure. So many people today in our world sacrifice the eternal for the temporal, experiencing the pleasures of sin for a season. But the pleasures of God in heaven are not temporary. They are eternal. There was a woman who had been diagnosed with cancer She'd been given just three months to live. She told her doctor, or rather her doctor told her that she needed to start making preparations to die, which is something that we all should be doing all the time. She contacted her preacher and had him to come over to her house to discuss certain aspects pertaining to her final wishes. She told him which songs she wanted sung in her service, what scriptures she would like to be read, and the dress that she wanted to wear. The woman told the preacher she wanted to be buried with her favorite Bible and everything was in order. The preacher was about to leave when the woman suddenly remembered something that was very important to her. There's one more thing, she said excitedly, and this is very important. I want to be buried with a fork in my right hand. The preacher looked at the woman not knowing quite what to say. That shocks you, doesn't it, she asked. The preacher said, well, to be honest, I am puzzled by the request. The one then explained, in all my years of attending church socials and functions where food was involved, my favorite part was when whoever was clearing away the dishes of the main course would lean over and say, you can keep your fork. It was my favorite part because I knew that something better was coming. When they told me to keep my fork, I knew I was about to receive something great. It wasn't jello, pudding. It was, it was cake or pie, something with substance. 
I just want people to see me there in the casket with a fork in my hand. I want them to wonder, what's with a fork? Then I want you to tell them something better is coming, so keep your fork too. The preacher's eyes welled up with tears as he hugged the woman goodbye. He knew that this would be one of the last times he would see her before her death, but he also knew that the woman had a great grasp of heaven. She knew something better was coming. At the funeral, people were walking by the woman's casket. They saw the pretty dress that she was wearing, her favorite Bible, and the fork placed in her right hand. Over and over, the preacher heard the question, what's with the fork? During his message, the preacher told the people about the conversation he had with the deceased a few days before. He then told them about the fork and what it symbolized to her. So, the next time you reach down for your fork to enjoy a piece of dessert, let it remind you there is something better coming. Yes, brethren, the best is yet to be. Heaven will surely be worth it all. I was reading a, a preacher friend's post yesterday as he discussed and shared with his readers about the hard week it had been for people he cared about. There was a, a former worker, a co-worker, works with a, a youth group Concord Road Church in Tennessee. Little two-year-old daughter, she had woke up in the middle of the night just two nights before, crying. Shortly after that, she stopped breathing. Little two-year-old didn't survive. And then there was a, a woman from Benton, some of his family. She was pregnant, expecting their third child. She had COVID-19. She was on a ventilator. They had intended to move her to, to a hospital in, in, over in the east of Kentucky, to a children's hospital, but she couldn't be moved because she was unconscious. They were lost. And what he said at the end was, the point he wanted to impress upon his reader's mind is that the only thing that matters is to be right with God right now. You and I don't have a guarantee of tomorrow. But you and I need to know that heaven be worth it all. Every, every sacrifice, every tear, every thing that you and I undergo as a Christian It'll be more. There's no comparison. There's no comparison with what you and I go through and experience for Jesus in the here and now compared to the eternal weight of glory that you and I will receive as we reap that everlasting life on the other side. Today, if you're subject to the imitation of Christ, you need to put Christ on in baptism. You need your sins washed away. That opportunity has afforded you at this hour. You don't have to leave lost. If you're not right with God, you are a Christian, but you're not living up the name you wear, would you come back home? Would you seek God's grace, His forgiveness, His mercy? Would you come while we stand, while we sing? We want to help everyone enter into the kingdom of heaven. There is information available here, but if you have a question, or if we can help you further in finding the Lord's way, please reach out to us using this contact information. We hope to hear from you soon.